Hello, glad to be with you again. We're going to continue digging through 1 Corinthians 13. We're down to verse 8. In the meantime, let's pray, and then we'll jump right in here. Dear Lord, we thank you for your kindnesses to us, the way that you have given us the Word of God. Help us to take it and grow by it, because it truly is the word that you need for us to know, that you desire for us to know, that we need to know. The need is on our part. Help us to uh, grab a hold of the truth and be blessed in them. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we go. If you remember, we've gone the last couple of times and talked about, um, in verses 4 through 7, what real love, the agape love of God looks like and what ours should look like. And it's very interesting talking about what real love does and does not do. There's a, there's a, there's a lot to that. And now he goes on to explain why love outshines and takes precedence over even the gifts that uh, the Holy Spirit gives as he'll con began, as he began talking about in chapter 12 and we'll talk about again in chapter 14. And we're in verse 8 where it says, love never fails. Verse 8 of chapter 13, love never fails. And it, it in the Amplified Bible, it says it this way, never fades out or becomes obsolete or comes to an end. When you have a choice, go for what lasts. That's my advice for tonight. Love never fails. It literally says love never falls and it's a wonderfully strong statement. It, the, the never, of course, means no, not ever, not at any time, not once. Just like when we say never and, and when we really mean it, it means never. There's a, there's a most durable, lasting um, tied to the power and eternity of God in his kind of love. In Lamentations chapter 3, Verses 21 to 24, Jeremiah the prophet is right in the middle of some terribly um, t suffering and, and, and downhearted time. He's depressed. It's been, it's been rough on him. And right in the very middle of that short little book, it says this. Chapter 3, verse 21 to 24 of Lamentations, it says, This I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. The Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. It comes from deep inside him, his, his soul. Um, the Lord is my portion. And it says, therefore, I have hope in him. I'm not, not left hopeless. I'm not left to face the dark all by myself. And when it says his, his, his compassions never fail, they're new every morning, it means they don't get old and worn out. They never get stale. They're always new, fresh, and shiny. And every morning you get up and they're there and they're bright and they're new and they're polished and they're, they're ready to go. So it's never does it fail. And the word fail is a word that means is never to be beaten down. It can't fall into ruin. It can't be overcome by attack or terror or evil intent. It can never collapse. In this, I see 1 John 4, 7, and 8. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And here's a fact. The gifts about which the Corinthians were, were debating and, and having disagreements on, and sometimes even tried to outdo each other on, um, if you look in 14 verses 26 through 23 of 1 Corinthians, it, it's a reference to that. We're not going to turn there right now. But they were different from the love in that the love is an aspect of God's own being, eternal and durable, because he's eternal and durable. As such, love would never be overcome, never fail from age, never erode or deteriorate like an old wall, never outlive its usefulness. It stays fresh and ever new because God is eternal. And God is love. And then verse 8 goes on. It says, love never fails, 
But if there are gifts of prophecy, they'll be done away. If there are tongues, they'll cease. If there's knowledge, it'll be done away. In contrast to love's durability, these other things will come to a time when they'll no longer be needed. Um, there's no longer going to be a need for further revelations through prophecy when you're standing right with the revealer and able to, to be with him and work with him. The need for the gifts of being able to understand and explain God's truth won't be necessary when you're right with God. And the, the final outcome uh, w will be we come to a place where f even further knowledge is not necessary because we'll be right there where the questions are all answered, as it goes on to tell us. In verse 9 it says, For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. The fact is, this while we're here living in this mixed bag of life where things are fogged up by sin and our own natural bent and people's hard-heartedness and hard-headedness and following their own agendas, that even these gifts are only part way to the things eternal. Even the best we have is still not complete. They still leave much to be desired. But verse 10, where it says, but when the perfect comes, the partial would be done away, means there's coming a time when everything will finally be completed. The partial stopgap things, the things that were given to help us through until the end, will be at the end. It will no longer be needed. There's a lot looking forward, isn't there? There's a lot of hope and, and considering what will be as we think about this stuff. In Romans chapter 8, verses 19 to 23, look at this. And we've talked about this before, but I can't help going back there again as we're on this viewpoint, this subject. For while the whole creation waits expectantly and longs earnestly for God's sons to be made known, the revealing or disclosing of their sonship, for the creation, or all of nature, was subjected to futility. It means condemned to frustration. There's a, there's a frustration factor that's built right into it. Not because of some intentional fault on its part. It, the creation didn't think this up. But it was the will of him who subjected it. Yet with hope that this creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and corruption and be brought into the glorious freedom of God's children. We know that all of creation has been mourning together in the pains of labor until now. Not only the creation, but we too. We go through this, feeling frustrated and, and feeling, feeling like, um, what's going on? Why aren't we there yet? And, uh, and stuff. But we groan inwardly as we wait for our adoption as sons at the redemption of our bodies. In other words, redemption means release on payment of a ransom. Now, we know that Christ died on the cross for our sins and paid our ransom. He rose from the dead. The payment's been made. The idea here is that the, the ransom's been paid and our release in completion of the deal, our release from bondage, will happen at the end when, when Christ Jesus shows up. The ransom's been paid. Price is done. We're no longer owned by our old master the flesh, Satan. Instead, we are looking forward to when we're actually picked up from the place where we've been held prisoner. And we will go to be with him. And at that time will be the fulfillment and completion of all of this that we've been talking about. So what I'm saying is, there's laid into the fabric of the whole creation a worm in our programming. You know what they're talking about when you talk about computers and they talk about a worm that's been put in there and it's destructive and it's, you can't hardly fight it and you can't get rid of it. It's, it's just in the very fabric of the program. Well, that's what's going on. It's a frustration factor. And it's at the temporariness and futility that seems to infest all of life. And a lot of people just surrender, give up. They say, well, you live, you die, and you become warm food. And that they never suspect that their frustration is actually meant for them to look up, to anticipate a change that will be revealed when Christ comes back. The meaning will all come together once Christ is here. Back in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 10, it says, There'll come a time 
when what's partial and incomplete will finally be laid aside because the complete has come. The transaction will be completed. There will be no more for us to look forward to because we'll be there. I keep thinking about kids riding in the car. Are we there yet? Well, if we're there yet, wouldn't we have stopped driving? Of course we're not there yet. We're going towards our goal. We're not to the goal yet. Then in, in verse, 30, verse 11, when I was a child, I used to speak like a child and think like a child and reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. Paul is saying, look, here's, here's what I'm getting at. He says, I used to do what kids do. I talked baby talk and then toddler talk. I thought from inexperience and the way kids, kids figure. I reasoned things out with an incomplete perspective of childhood. Those were all part of being a kid. He says, but then I grew up. I didn't have to learn anymore how to communicate. I know how to. Or how to think and reason as if I was a child who had no experience and had never seen anything of life. Those things were laid aside. Now, he said, I grew up. Well, the same thing's happening. We're growing up. When I was a kid, we lived on a little farm. And that farm was um, not too far from our neighbors, but it was... It was uh, and we, we knew the folks around us. It was a real small little community. And one neighbor down the road had a boy. His name was Randy. And Randy would come to visit with us. Randy was a big kid. Where we were eight or nine years old, he was 15. We thought and acted like eight or nine-year-olds. But so did Randy. His mental abilities to figure stuff out was arrested. It stopped at about nine years old, probably. Now, he probably weighed 180 pounds, and all us little 80 and 90 pound kids would be playing, and he'd want to wrestle, and when he started throwing you around, he could hurt you really bad if you weren't careful, because he, he didn't have good judgment. It didn't let him see the consequences of what he did, and <laughs> he hadn't left it behind childish things. They were um, the, a part of him. It was how he thought all the time, and it was it was uh, it was a little sad, but he was an example. It would be that way if we don't mature, if we don't grow and put away childish things, if we always stayed childish in everything we did, that would be a sad thing. But Paul says, no, we grow past that. We mature. We've come to the place where things finally make sense that we used to wonder about because we grow up and we see it differently. And so Paul says, when I was a kid, I did like kids do. When I became a man, I put those things aside. And then verse 12, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I'll know fully, just as I have also been fully known. Now we see in a mirror dimly. What he's saying is, we look at everything. All the eternal things are as if we have a fogged up mirror, and we're using it to try and spot what's going on in the eternal. And we're looking and we're trying and we catch a little glimpse of this, a flash of color there a bit, but details are scanty and we don't have enough information. And you, you, you look and you think, but one day there'll come a time when we turn from the mirror and we look face on at the very Savior who saved us and the eternal things that he's been preparing us for. And the reality will be entirely different than looking into that flawed surface as we're doing now. In the Amplified Bible, it, it reads this way, verse 12. But then I shall know and understand fully and clearly, even in the same manner as I have been fully and clearly known and understood by God. There'll be a completion to all this that we've been wondering about. This chapter is a fantastic chapter as it describes and defines what the different aspects of love are we need that we need to say am i falling short of god's love and we need to come to the lord and say look i haven't got it yet come and love through me make it so i'm demonstrating the love that's persistent that isn't hurt every time someone bruises me a little that that makes me hang on even when someone doesn't deserve it let me love like that. It can only come from you in me. And so it brings us back and we keep coming for his supply. But 
even more, it goes on and says, but look, we're looking with excitement to what's coming. There'll be a time when all this is laid aside, when everything fog in the mirror is out of the way, when we'll see face to face the very one who went through all this for us, who created us, who brought us to be a part of his family by his own desire, his own design. This is incredible. Now, there's only one teeny little verse left. Verse 13. But now faith, hope, Love, abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. We're not going to look at that this week. We're going to look at it next time. And the reason is, I started studying that verse out, and I found that it was so full of stuff I couldn't get done quick. And so we're going to pull the plug on this study, and we'll come back to this. And I am really excited for the things that are to be dug out of this very last verse. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this, your word. There's a lot to get excited about. But again, it fans the embers of hope in us. It, it warms again the, the understanding we're heading towards someplace. This isn't just treading water till we die. This is heading in a direction that you have designed for us to be. For us to be with you, to be completed, to come to the end of what all this is preparation for. Help us to be able to help others who are frustrated with life, who thinks that there's no meaning and no depth to it, and to show them there's a reason to hold on. There's a reason to keep going. There's a future and a hope that you can be a part of. Grab a hold of the Lord. That's where the future's heading. And we need to do that. So help us. Help us to be able to express it clearly, simply, and with the love that you've designed us to be carriers of. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. These things are really fine. You can take this. It By now, if you've read through the chapter several times, it's gotten familiar to you. But examine it again and again and again. You can never look too many times and examine something as wonderful as this passage of Scripture. So keep at it. Don't give up. Don't quit if you've not got it right yet. Don't quit if you think you got it right yet. If you think you got it right now, you're probably having a problem. If you don't think you got it right, you probably need to come to the Lord and say, Hey, help out. I'm, I'm trying, but I can't do it on my own. I need you. And let the Lord know and pray to him, tell him. And uh, you're in partnership. He wants to supply all you need to do what he's called on you to do. Love like God loves. I titled this, what God's love looks like, and what ours should look like. This is the, the love of God. So we'll dig into verse 13 next time. Until then, keep reading.